we go to the Lord in prayer, I want to invite you to come forward to this altar. There's a need that's heavy on your heart this morning. This is a great place to come and lay it before the Lord this morning. Uh, let's do that now as we go to Him in prayer. Father, this morning as we stand before your presence, as some of us gather around this altar and kneel before you, taking a, a posture of humility, a posture of a servant, a posture of surrender, a posture of humility and trust. Lord, all across this room, from our hearts, that is our posture before you, knowing that you alone are our God, you alone are creator, sustainer of life. You alone are the, the source of our life, not just our physical life, but Lord, more importantly, our spiritual life, our eternal life is in you. And so, God, we give you praise and thanks this morning for that and lift up and honor your name, the name of Jesus. We want Christ to be magnified as we've just sung. Lord, all across this place, we think about the week we've come from and been through, Lord, in many ways you have been glorified in the sacrifices of those here and the surrender, the service, the work. But Lord, there's other places where we failed you, and we ask for your forgiveness for those places, God. Would you purify us by the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, and make us clean and white again before you. Lord, we, we come before you this morning as people and as a church that need you, that need your Holy Spirit. And we ask this morning that your Holy Spirit would just permeate this place right now. That you would settle upon this place in a way that is unmistakable. That hearts and lives are um, open to you. And that you're doing a work right now. God, we're holding nothing back. We're, we're not going to put up a wall between us and you. But God, we're going to take down that wall. And, and God, you're going to come in. And, and you're going to speak to our hearts. Speak to our minds and, in a way that only you can. So we give you permission to do that today. And invite your spirit to be here. God, we need your spirit to empower us as a church, to be who you've called us to be. We need your spirit to empower us to live our lives daily for you and that, God, the many choices we have to make, the many actions we partake of, God, that the decisions we'll make in our lives as far as, for some of us, big decisions, future of careers and spouses and, and children, God. For others, it's, it's just the daily, the mundane choices. But, God, we want to honor you in all that we can do. And so, Lord, we ask your Holy Spirit to help us to do that. Lord, we thank you that we have a place to gather to worship you. We think about those around the world this morning who don't. God, there are so many uh, Christian believers around the world and countries around the world who are gathering today under threat of persecution, even their very lives. And so we pray for them, for strength and for power and for your spirit to be there and to, to lift them up. We pray for transformation in those countries. God, that good and righteous leaders would be put into place. We pray that for our own country, Lord, that you would put the right people in place. We pray for our leaders as your word tells us to do that, God. We pray for our president and the Congress. We pray for our uh, state officials and our local officials, God, that you would just be with each one and, God, that you would bless them and, and uh, God, that you would speak to them and help them to do what's right, not what's politically expedient, not what's popular, but to do what's right. And God, may that start with us as we each seek to do what's right, as we each seek, each seek to pray and lift them up to you. May we not fail in doing that. Father, we ask that now in this time we have together, you'd speak to us uh, through your word. You'd speak to us through the testimony of, of uh, Christina about to share. And uh, Lord, may you be glorified in all we do in this service and beyond. In Jesus' name. Glad to have Pastor Brenda and Rick back. They had a nice vacation, so glad to have them back. Kids, you can go with them, and we're so glad you're with us in the service this morning. Well, one of the things we started last year, I think we've been doing it at least a year now, is uh, on the second Sunday of every month, we call it I Am Second Sunday, and it's kind of a playoff of um, an organization that does uh, online testimonies, where people record their testimonies. Uh, but we're doing this as a way to say God is first, Christ is first, and we are second. We take second place to Him. And uh, so we've asked people from our congregation to share their testimony, their personal testimony of how Christ saved them and uh, what he's done in their lives. And we've just, it's been a blessing to hear from your brothers and sisters uh, what God's been doing. So this morning, uh, I've asked Christina Carell, or actually she volunteered and I asked her if she could do this week. So Christina's going to come at this time. 
And uh, if you come on up, then you can go up there uh, and use the pulpit. So thanks for sharing, Christina. Let's welcome her. Uh, Christina is our Washington Pumpkin. Yeah. Many of you don't know this, she's our treasurer of this church. And uh, she volunteered for that job, sort of. <laughs> uh, but it's a, it's a big job. She spends hours every week in paying bills, writing checks, making sure the lights stay on, making sure the staff gets paid, making sure um, the tithes and offerings from this church go to the appropriate places around the world. It's a huge job, and she is so worthy of our thanks for that. So we appreciate Christina. <laughs> Elena and Charlie, two of the teens in our youth group, uh, quizzers and uh, great kids. And uh, so we're so glad to have you share. So go ahead, Christine. All right, so Pastor Andrew said all that, so I'm done, right? Yeah. <laughs> <That's my testimony. laughs> um, just for future reference, everyone, you can only tell Pastor Andy no two times. The third time you have to say yes. In reference to my treasure position. <laughs> Actually, God said yes. I have nothing to do with that. But, um, so as you can see, I have several pages here, but it's all size 14 font double space, so <laughs> Okay, so I was born and raised here in Michiana. Um, born specifically in South Bend, but raised in Mishawaka. Um, my parents divorced when I was three. I think around three. Um, so I had the advantage of having twice as many parents and twice as many grandparents as some kids. Twice as many Thanksgivings, twice as many Christmases, Twice as many of a lot of things. That is always how I looked at it growing up. I'm going to take a first, a few minutes to first talk to you about my dad. He has played the most instrumental role in my faith walk, and the primary reason I'm standing here today, as a lot of you have already heard me speak about that. Um, since my parents were divorced, I lived with my mom and only stayed with my dad every other weekend. However, my dad always made it a point every Sunday to stop by and pick me up with my sister and drag us to church. As I got older in my teenage years, more often than not, I didn't want to get up early and go to church. See, if you couldn't tell by looking at me, I was, and probably still am, a very prissy girl. <laughs> Always had to have her hair and makeup just right, so it took me longer than the average girl to get ready, which meant I had to get up that much earlier. So there were plenty of Sundays when I really just wanted to tell him that I was too tired to get up and that I didn't want to go to church. But I didn't have it in me to disappoint him. The first time I gave my life to the Lord, I remember very well. I was around eight or nine years old, and I remember the exact dress that I was wearing because my mom had made it for me, and I wore it to my dad's brother's wedding previous before that. And it was the first time I got to wear pantyhose, so that was very exciting. <laughs> But at that time, we were attending a church on the south side of South Bend, where the children's church was actually in a separate building. It was actually the original building of the, the, the church, and they built a larger building behind. So we actually worshiped in a sanctuary, and the children's services were in the sanctuary. So when the children's pastor announced the altar call, because you couldn't just stay in your seat and say the prayer to yourself. You had to present a physical, um, representation of your decision to do that. I had felt this feeling come over me, a feeling like I had no control over my legs. The next thing I knew, I was down in front, praying for Jesus to enter my heart. I had attended a handful of churches growing up. Um, my first experience with church that I can remember is my father was raised in the Christian science faith. So if anyone knows anything about that, it's um, very different from most Christian faiths is the fact that they don't they didn't believe in um, modern science. So my father grew up not going to a doctor or um, getting vaccinated. Um, my grandparents were both very passionate about that and I appreciate and respect them for having that um, faith when they still had a relationship with God and I still believe that they're in heaven now. But my dad, as a teenager, um, started to question um, that reasoning, just being exposed to other classmates and everything. So I did attend that church a little bit growing up, but um, the first the church that my dad took me to was the evangelical church um, owned by a televangelist. So you can imagine um, a lot of like calling out, 
speaking in tongues, a lot of people fainting during the service. So, and in that time, they talked about the end of the world a lot and the coming and the you know the, the um, a lot of stuff about Revelation. So, as a young person, that was a little scary, but I'm sure a lot of you experienced that same uh, talk about the end of the world. Um, and then in high school, I attended um, Trinity Evangelical Free Church on the south side of South Bend. And that's where my dad um, was still a member. Okay, so um, let me get back to my notes. I attended a handful of churches growing up. Each church we went to had different aspects and qualities and people I liked and enjoyed. I always remember the names and faces of the Sunday school teachers. I don't always, but I do remember the stories and lessons they taught me. I also remember feeling God in my heart and seeing him work in my life. I am grateful that I was exposed to all these different churches because I still gained something from each one. Each church implanted a seed or impression in me that I've carried with me throughout my life. When I went away to college, I attended a private Christian university. I say it like that because I didn't feel God or Christ on campus. There were no religious events or chapels. Um, I want to make a side note on this that um, if you send your children to a Christian school, college, that you just make sure that it's a true Christian school. I claim to be that, but I know after the fact, I realized it really wasn't. So it was a relief to go off on my own, not having anyone to hold me accountable for my actions or decisions, no one telling me to go to church. It was so easy and felt so free. I learned very quickly that not being a Christian was so much easier than having a relationship with Jesus. And at that time, I definitely was not living the life of a Christian. Then I met Chuck the summer between my junior and senior year of college. I like to refer to it as the best summer of my life. <laughs> we spent every waking moment together. When the time came for me to leave and go back to school, it was very hard. He came to visit at least every other weekend. And by November of that year, I left school and came home to be closer to him. By the following November, we were engaged. And 18 months later, in May 20, 2000, like we were married. Even though Chuck and I had so much love and respect in our relationship, there was still one thing missing, and that was God. I thought about going back to church, but I wasn't quite ready to leave that free and easy lifestyle of being a non-Christian. I felt like I was in control, and I was in charge of my life. I had struggled with control a lot in my younger life, other have, others having control over me and feeling like I had no say in my life. So Chuck and I continued on in our lives, and our promotion for Chuck took us to Northwest Indiana, where we made a life as newlyweds. All of this time, I could feel God whispering to me, telling me that I needed to go back to church and renew my relationship with him. Chuck and I talked about our future together and that we wanted to have kids one day, I knew that I was going to raise my kids in church. That was always going to be the plan. But I felt like I just needed to hang on to that control a little bit longer. One of Chuck's co-workers invited us to his church. I later found out that these invitations were presented over and over for several weeks or months, unknown to me, and that he finally relented. So we started attending a church together in Northwest Indiana. Right away, we got involved in the youth group, volunteering on Wednesday nights. When Elena was born, we just put her in a stroller and brought her along. After Elena came, Chuck and I, really mostly Chuck, realized that even though we were only 75 miles away from family, we needed to be closer. Plus, who doesn't need free babysitting? So Chuck found a job back here in Mishawaka. The week we closed on the new house, I found out I was pregnant with Charlie. Boy, was that a surprise. I always say that it's harder to decide when to have the second one than the first. Luckily for us, God made that decision for us. Shortly after we went back to the area, we started attending South Bend first, sporadically. Thank you so much to Uncle Pete and Aunt Sherry for inviting us. Chuck at that time worked retail, and he was rarely off on Sundays. So the two little ones under the age of two, it was hard for me to get to church without him. But once the kids got older and started attending children's services, God laid it on my heart to make more of a commitment to get my kids to church every week. 
It was also around that time that I became more involved in volunteering in the children's department. I wanted my kids to have the same experience that I did growing up, and I wanted to provide that same experience to other people's children. I wanted those seeds to be planted in their hearts. I wanted to plant those seeds in the hearts of other children. Volunteering in the church has brought more to my life than I could ever get in return. Every person can contribute in some way. I am definitely not a teacher, nor do I know everything about the Bible, but through God I can do those things. I love the analogy of the body of Christ. Every organ and cell has a purpose. We are all the body of Christ. I have one more point to share, and then I'll let Pastor Andy come up. I am so extremely grateful for our God, how he protected me when I was the furthest away from him. Definitely when I deserved it the least. But that is what is so great about our God. That no matter what, he loves us more than anything. That he will protect us from anything, even from ourselves. He can carry us through anything. We can survive anything, every loss every health problem, every financial problem, as long as we have him in our lives. So think about the body of Christ and what part you are. A finger, a brain cell, an eyelash. We're all part of the body of Christ. Some of you had uh, maybe grandchildren, maybe started a new job. So there's a lot of good things from the past year. But most of us, it sounds like all of us here, are typically ready for a new year, right? We like to look ahead. In fact, we need to look ahead as, as human beings, as people. It's very important for us to be able to look ahead in order to keep growing. We have to be anticipating what is coming. But the same is true of the church. The same is true of the church. We have to be looking ahead. We have to be stepping into what God has planned for us ahead. Now, it's important to remain connected to the past, right? To remain rooted in, uh, in our history, biblical history, right? To know and to be connected to what God has done throughout history, salvation history, we often sometimes call it. Um, we have to be connected to what God is doing in your own personal life, the salvation he has done in your life. You need to remember your salvation. Now, often when we do baptisms, that's a time for us to look back and remember when we too were saved and baptized or to hear testimonies like Christina just shared and to remember when Christ saved us and that journey leading us up to that. It's important to remember and remain, remain rooted in that past. It's important to remain rooted in the local church, the history of this church, what God has done here, and, and uh, to know that story and to realize that you and I are a part of it. We stand on the shoulders of those who've gone before. Many who've not been here. I've done over, over 30 funerals since I've been here in 10 years. Most of those people from this church. Some of you will never know them this side of eternity. But you're here, and this church exists in part because of their sacrifice, their giving, their faithfulness, their prayers, their teaching. So, important to remain connected to our past in that way. But time stops for no one, right? 
It's not 1921 anymore when this church was founded. It's, it's not even 2001. It's 2023, believe it or not. So we need to be the church, not of 1921. Not even sometimes people say, we've got to go back and be the New Testament church. And I always think, I understand what they're saying. We want to have that vitality and that spirit fire that they had back then. But, but we need to be the church for 2023. For the people and for the world of 2023, we must be who God's called us to be for today. And so for the next three weeks, uh, we're going to be starting this series called, uh, called Together We Can. Uh, let me see if I can get it up there. Well, there we go. We got it there. So Together We Can, right? Uh, looking ahead to what God has for us in 2023, this is the theme God has laid on my heart is that we work together. What can we do together as a church? Well, I want us to turn, if you would, with me to John's Gospel, chapter 17. John's Gospel, chapter 17, page 1680 in your pew Bible in front of you there. If you want to grab that and follow along. John's Gospel, chapter 17. As you're turning there, just a little bit of introduction to this passage, uh, if you're unfamiliar, the word is new to you. Uh, this is a passage uh, where Jesus is gathered with his followers, called disciples. Uh, this is uh, a time, the final time he's together with them before he's going to be betrayed, crucified, and uh, died and buried in the tomb. And then eventually, you know, God raised him by God's power. He raised to life again. That's how we have new life. But this is his time with his disciples. And he is talking to them and sharing with them and instructing them. He, he, he um, institutes the Lord's Supper communion with them. Uh, but this, this is the time, chapter 17, where he is actually praying for them. It's called, often we call it the high priestly prayer because like uh, the highest of high priests, Christ prays and intercedes for us. And so the high priestly prayer of Jesus and in his prayer, Jesus, the first part of it, he prays for himself. Think about that. The Son of God has to approach the Father in this hour of need, even as the Son of God, and ask for him to be with him and sustain him in this mission, this final few steps of the mission. Then he prays for the disciples, those who are gathered there with him in the upper room. And then finally, he prays for all believers. For you and for me, when he prayed that prayer in that moment, God who was outside of time, he saw you and he saw me right here this moment today. His prayer is effectual for you and for me. And so this is the high priestly prayer of Christ Jesus. And let's uh, read together. Let's stand together. We've been sitting for a while. Let's stand in honor of God's word. We're going to start chapter 17, start at verse 13, partway through his prayer. Jesus says this. And praise this to God. I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still here in the world, so that they, that's his disciples, may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world, any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them. In other words, set, the word means set apart. Set them apart in your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified, set apart. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. That's us. That all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and I have loved them even as you have loved me. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. There are three things that are going to kind of guide us over the next three weeks, and they're found here. There's, I mean, there's so much. You can, I could preach for months on this, but they're found in verse 21, and it's this. Jesus says, praise, 
He prays that they may be one. That's us. That they may be one as we are one. Jesus says, as the Father and He are one, may we be one. In order that the world may believe. May they be one as we are one that the world be, may believe. And I see this, as I look at that, I see this in three ways. First of all, they may be one. It is the Spirit. May, may we be one in spirit. Be united together in our spirit together. Uh, the Spirit of Christ. May we be one as Christ and the Father are one. And the way they are one together is pure truth, right? It, there is no falsehood in the relationship between God and His Son, who is also God Himself, God the Son. Uh, they are united together in truth. So, may we, we be one in spirit as they are one in truth, and then the world may believe we may be one in our mission. So we're going to look at those three things. Actually, in the bulletin, there's a bit of a typo. That's my fault, not Carol's. But uh, we should, this week we'll be focusing on uh, being united in spirit. Next week we'll look at united in truth. How many of you enjoy um, documentaries? Anybody? Raise your hand. A lot of people enjoy this. How many of you enjoy documentaries or even maybe television shows about survival? Right? Surviving in the wilderness. I love that kind of stuff, right? Um, I, I would probably survive for a minute in the, as out in the wilderness, but uh, I like to watch other people survive. One of the really interesting shows that uh, I, I, I haven't seen uh, much of it personally, but I've, I've heard about it, is a show uh, in, from History Channel called Alone. Anybody seen Alone? Okay, a few of you. The, the premise of the show Alone is 10 people, contestants, they have to go through a, 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 you know, a, trial, a trial to get into the show, uh, but they choose 10 people. To go and survive in the wilderness alone for as long as possible. Uh, the winner, whoever survives the longest, uh, the early seasons they would win five hundred thousand dollars, and later seasons they would win a million dollars. Now they don't know how long they don't they're, they're, they don't see each other. They don't know when somebody else has 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 quit. Um, they just have to keep surviving as long as they can, absolutely alone. You get to take a few uh, items with them. They get to choose like ten survival items. That they have, but that's all they have, right? Maybe an axe, maybe a knife, uh, you know, maybe a water purification, whatever it might be. And they have to survive as long as they can, isolated from all human contact. They can tap out at any time. I quit. I can't do this, right? How long do you think the average length of the winter over this took place over nine seasons, so about 90 people? What do you think the average length was for the person who lasted the longest each season? You just call out a guess. Weeks. Two weeks, 30 days. 10 days. 10 days. Okay, a little bit longer. Those are good guesses. A little bit longer. 70 days were the winners. These are, these are remote places. Alaska, British Columbia, Patagonia, places like that. Uh, 70 days. So two months and a few days was the average length of the winner. But the average length, you guys are much closer to the average length overall, right? The overall length, the average survival was 33 days made it just about a month. And many people survived for, a well, few people survived a day. <laughs> they injured themselves and they had to, they had to quit. Uh, other people got terrified of bears, as you can imagine, that would probably be me. Like, I don't want to get eaten by a bear. Um, so 33 days. I think what that reveals to us, and many other things reveal to us, but one of the things that reveals to us is that we're not meant to live alone. When the pioneers traveled across the country, they traveled in wagon trains, right? Uh, they traveled with others, their family, other family members, uh, other people from towns and communities, because together they were more likely to survive. They could specialize in doing different things and all that, but together they were more likely to make it than if they were alone. Scientists have studied this, sadly, looking at orphanages around the world, some places that are terrible. Babies uh, die without touch. Babies that are born, if they're not cuddled and hugged, uh, I don't know what sick person decided to study that, but uh, anyway, babies, that they, won't, they, they will become sickly and they will even die without touch. We can't survive on our own. We can't survive for long by ourselves. Even a gentleman, I, I watched a program called Alone in the Wilderness, this man named Richard Pernecki, uh, he moved to Alaska. He survived uh, alone for 30 years, but he wasn't entirely alone. He had some contact, he had supplies shipped in, he saw people from time to time, 
but it's very rare, and even he had connections. The Bible talks about the importance of us being united together, uh, of helping one another. In Ecclesiastes, it's written this, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. In other words, you can do more together than you can alone, right? We all know that. Um, if either of them falls, uh, falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. Think about surviving again out in the rugged terrain of the, the wilderness of the Middle East there. Um, you keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. Like it or not, we need each other. Look around this room. We need each other. Sometimes we need each other more. Sometimes we maybe don't need it quite as much. Um, sometimes we may not feel like we need it, but we need each other. It's how we're created. You're not created to, to be alone. You're not created to, to live uh, your life alone. You're not created to live uh, the Christian life alone. God, in his providential care for us, gave us and formed us into the church. I love what Christina shared a little bit ago about the, 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 the way that the body, God made the, the, the body of Christ, all the different parts that work together, right? We need one another. If you and I are going to survive, let alone flourish as individuals and as a church, then we need each other. We need other believers. I think about, again, I appreciate Christina sharing, uh, memories that I have. She talked about Sunday school teachers. I think about people like uh, Lula, Lula Lawrence, an older woman in my church growing up. She's probably in her 80s or 90s. I mean, when you're seven years old, everybody's like, <laughs> looks really old. And I remember Lula would greet at the door. You're never too old to serve in the church, okay? She was greeting at the door every Sunday. And when I would come in uh, around Christmas time, I think, and my birthday, uh, she would give me a $2 bill. It was a nice little it was a special gift. She thought of me. Was there welcoming people? I think of people like Don and Cindy Unruh, who were uh, my Sunday school teachers when I was a teenage boy. And I remember with shame in my heart uh, making Cindy cry in class because I was being ornery, right? Um, I was sitting there, and I shouldn't tell this, I was a teenager. Mom probably doesn't know this. And uh, so my friend Aaron and I, <laughs> it's good to have mom here, but sometimes it's hard. Um, <laughs> We're sitting in the class, and, uh, and me and my friend Aaron were just being warm. We were sitting, all we were doing is sitting there with our legs straight out of our chairs, okay? Teens don't do this, okay? We just, was, they were like, put your, your legs down, and we just kept sticking our legs up. I, I don't even know why, but she was just frustrated with us, and I remember making my Sunday school teacher cry. But they loved us. They cared for us. They taught us every week, and many other teachers did the same over the years. Vacation Bible schools, children's ministries, children's church, all those things. I remember... People like Betsy Peterson. Betsy was, again, in her uh, late 80s, early 90s in Kansas City, uh, one of the first places that I pastored. Uh, she was a retired uh, artist for American greeting cards. She used to design greeting cards. And she was so sweet, so faithful, and so loving every Sunday. Just so so encouraging and supporting of, you know, here, who, who am I? You know, this this mid-20s pastor. And so encouraging and prayed for us and loved us. I remember people like Lenny Farley in Lafayette. Lenny was a forester for, um, still is, for Purdue uh, University. And he taught the uh, college age class and the young adults, and he did that faithfully. He still does that to this day. He's been doing it for, I don't know, 20 or 30 years, right? Faithful, serving. I remember people in Toledo like Dave and Kathy Hirschberger, uh, who were, was a family that uh, had two, had three teenage kids, rather. One was had graduated within a year after being there, but came and helped uh, our family start planting a church there in Toledo, Ohio. And they were from a, a larger church, but they gave up everything that was there to come and help us plant this church and, and bring their teens and serve. And actually, amazingly enough, that, uh, today, uh, Dave is a, uh, an ordained pastor. He, he got called to ministry during our time together in Toledo and is ordained, and his kids are all in ministry. It's amazing. Uh, but I think of people like that. And I think about so many more people uh, in my life, in my pe in people, in this church, that have inspired me, that have loved me, that have supported me and my family, that have supported and loved you. 
And I think about, it's interesting, I was thinking about Pete as I was writing this. And, and if you know Pete Thompson and, and this church, I think about three quarters of the people here are Thompson related somehow. Uh, not quite that many, but a lot of them. Uh, and it started with one, one, one man, what God had done in his life. And he invited people, his family, because he wanted them to know that the world might believe, right? I think about Bob Ward, and I think about the Corrells, and I think about all of you who've invited, who've invited people here, and people have become saved as a result of that. All those people. So many people that I can't even remember their names. And each one of them is a fellow Christian that God has given to me and to others, to you and others in these churches to help us in this life. Uh, I, I'm not here today standing here this morning without them. You're not here today without them. Stop for a moment. Just take a moment and think about those people in your life that told you about Jesus. The Sunday school teachers, the, maybe somebody that picked you up and drove you to church. Maybe somebody that taught you, maybe whoever it was that led you to the Lord or discipled you or somebody that's prayed with you or, or worked with you and walked with you through a dark time. Just take a moment and think about that person right now or those people. You're not here this morning. I'm not here this morning without them. God has used them in a powerful way in your life. To say it in the affirmative, we're here because of them. We're here because of what God has done in their lives, because of their faithfulness, because they were obedient to Him. And in that moment, maybe it was uncomfortable, uh, as Christina said, for that coworker Chuck to invite you time after time, and you probably said no a few times, but they kept trying and they kept praying for you, and it was uncomfortable. But but they were obedient, they were faithful, and you're here because those people were faithful and obedient. They they taught you when you were an ornery uh, 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 youth group student, right? Or when you were a young, uh, a young adult and you didn't really know what you're doing or you thought you knew everything but you didn't have all the answers but they loved you anyway and they, they helped guide you and they taught you the truth, right? Maybe it's a pastor. I, I don't know who it is, but you're here and we're here because of them and we're connected to them and them to us. You see, as we look at that scripture this morning, that you and I are living it out. They may be one as we are one that the world may believe. We're living that out. We're living proof of that here this morning. What is it that binds us all together? It's not just friendship. It's not just common experiences. But what binds us all together, what bound a little boy in Lima, Ohio to an 85-year-old door greeter, to a 90-year-old uh, retired card artist, what bound a young youth pastor to a Purdue Forester, what binds an OSU fan with a bunch of Notre Dame fans, <laughs> right? And even Michigan fans, I was saying, binds us together, right, Kathy, right, Janet? Dave, where's Dave? Dave, where's Dave? What binds us together is the Holy Spirit of God. It's not anything we do, it's, it's a spirit. You, you can't bind yourself together. You think about like uh, chemical, uh, uh, physical things. They need to be bound together by some force, right? Carbon atoms, they need to, there's a force that binds them together. What binds us together as the church is the spirit of God. The spirit of Christ. Paul puts it this way. And uh, we have it up here on our banners. I don't know if you noticed, we switched the banners out this week, moving out of Advent and Christmas now into kind of the season before Easter. Uh, but it's written up here on our banners. It's up here most every week throughout the year. There is one Lord, or one body, and one spirit. Not like many spirits, but there's one spirit, and there's one body, the church, one Holy Spirit. Just as you were called to one hope when you were called, there's one Lord. Not many. Not many pass in heaven, but just one. There's one faith. There's only one way, truth, and life Jesus, through Jesus Christ. There's one faith and there's one baptism in Him. One God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Now that's not pantheism, right? God's not the tree. The tree's not God. It is to say that God that permeates all things. He is the creator of all things. It's His very breath 
that sustains all things. We're bound together in Christ by His Spirit. I remember uh, one time driving in the car, just sharing some stories from my childhood, but uh, riding, and it was after a church gathering, and uh, I was, I don't know, probably pre-teen, maybe early teens, and just that unity we had together in the church. There was a there was a there was a wonderful church, a great church that I grew up in. It grew from a, a church of about about our size to a church of, at one point was over two thousand people uh, about a decade ago. Anyway, I remember riding home and, and uh, asking the question, just in the innocence of the childhood. I said, uh, you know, mom or dad, uh, whoever was in the driving at that time. I said, why is it that I feel closer to my church family and friends sometimes than I do to my own biological family? Right? It's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit binds us together. That's why we can that's why we can be united together with one another, even though we have a lot of differences. We don't like all the same things. We're not from the same place. We don't have the same kinds of jobs or the same interests, whatever. But we're bound together by something much more important, the Holy Spirit of Christ. We're bound together in his salvation, his forgiveness. And as we're bound together, this church, each of us, we have a purpose. Amen. South Bend First Church of the Nazarene has a purpose. And God has not done with us yet. He's still got a plan for this church. He says that they may be one as we are one that the world may believe. His plan, our purpose is for us as a church to reach the lost for Jesus. Amen? That's, that's why we exist. We exist to worship Him, to honor Him, but as we do that, as we come together and are one in Him, that the world might believe. Our purpose is to reach the lost for Jesus. And here's the thing, I can't do it alone. And you can't do it alone. Pastor Brenda, Pastor Christina, Pastor Rebecca, they can't do it alone. We need one another. Together we can. Alone we can't. Alone we perish, alone we die, alone we shrivel up, alone we miss out on what God has for us. But together, we can. I've got something I want to show you here in a minute. No, it's not the stool. <laughs> I'm going to set it there. I love my wife so much, I just wanted to get her some flowers. <laughs> I do love her. But these flowers are not for her. <laughs> these flowers... Were a gift to my daughter for uh, one of my daughters for Christmas. My other daughter has another set of them. I don't know if you can tell from where you're sitting, but these are not real flowers. In other words, they're not like they weren't grown in the ground. They are. How many of you know? Can you tell what they are? They're Lego flowers, right? These are made out of Legos. So you can see here. Here's one of the leaves, but that's just a Lego. So uh, it's amazing what they can make with Legos. Interesting thing about Legos, as I was thinking of how to illustrate what I'm talking about, is that each brick, they call it a brick, I don't know what they call these special fancy ones, but the original, just the little rectangular brick, uh, each brick has so many bumps on it, okay? Uh, so many little knobs, and I think all of you know what they are. You've stepped on them in the middle of the night at some point in your life. Uh, <laughs> they have these little bumps on them, and that's how they connect to each other, right? Some of them have some of them are bigger pieces, they have more bumps, others are small, they have fewer bumps. Uh, but, but each Lego can only connect to so many other Legos until it runs out of bumps, right? You only have so many bumps. And, and in the church, in the same way, I only have so many bumps that I can connect with people, so many ways that I can do that, right? Uh, people that will connect with me, uh, and people that I can connect with. And you only have so many. But the amazing thing is about Legos is they're not meant just to be one Lego by itself connected to just a couple others. It's all the Legos together. When they all come together, they can create something as, actually, Legos can actually be beautiful like this. It's all the different bumps, all the different pieces, all the different types connected together, come together to create something that looks as amazing as that. I can't do it alone. I only have so many knobs. The staff here can't do it alone. They only have so many knobs. It takes all of us, each of us, every part together to connect with the people God sends 
our way. I've got a picture of it. There it is. Help me head it up there. Yeah. So you can kind of, you can't see this one. You can see that a little better. This year has been a challenging year. The last couple years have been really challenging. Been really challenging for me personally. It's been a hard year. It's been a hard couple years. I read this in the last year or so that 38%, this is a George Barnard research, you know, he does some of the premier research work. 38% of pastors in America have at some point thought about quitting in the last year. That's up 10% from the beginning of 2021, from 29%, almost 10%, 29% to 38%. I've had to make decisions as the leader of the church that some people don't like. I've had to preach things that some people were bothered by or offended by. I've had friends leave. I've been in the hospital with folks, sick folks, dying folks, more times than I can count this year, buried loved ones. I've heard stories of heartbreak in the privacy of my office or telephone or out at lunch. I've had to cut budgets, cut ministry budgets, grown the church in the last couple years from 180 to 120. I've heard stories of heartbreak, witnessed failures, I failed myself. But through it all, the one thing that has sustained me, the one thing that has sustained me in the midst of all of that, is God's faithfulness to me. He's always been faithful. He's always walked with me through the valley of the shadow of death. He's never given up on me. My family, Barbie and my kids, my extended family have sustained me, have supported me. Your love, your care, your grace toward me as a church has sustained me. And God's calling has sustained me. It's the calling that keeps me going. If there was anything else that I could do, God knows I would probably go and do it. It's not because I don't like pastoring, it's because sometimes it's just, it's a lot. And I know I stand up here and, and I, I don't try to exude confidence or anything like that, but I try to do my, my calling and do my job and do it to the best of my ability. And so you may not always see all of those things, but I feel every last thing that I've shared with you. Everything that you feel in a family of four or five or ten, I feel in a family of 200 and more. I've walked that journey. In the quietness of my house, Laying in bed at night, I've, I've had to bear these things. But it's God's calling. Reaching the lost is not a slogan for me. It's not just something I say. It's not just something we put on, on, on bulletins. It's not just something I put on a slide, on a screen. It's, it's, it's not something we just say at this church. It's something that I believe, reaching the lost. And there's no greater joy in my life than to see people come to know Jesus as their Savior and to be discipled in Him and to grow in Him in truth. To see young people, to see children being taught the Word. And you saw this young adult class, this college class up here, what they're studying, going through the Word, reading through the Bible. There's nothing that makes me happier, that's more fulfilling to me than seeing that. That's all I care about in this church. See people come to know Jesus, come to know His truth, be shaped and formed, uh, be battle-hardened to go out into the world. And so it's worth going through all of those things. I know you've gone through terrible things and difficult things in your life. I don't belittle that. But we're each called. And so as I look at 2023, as I look ahead, I, just this idea of together we can. It's been a difficult few years. I'm sure you felt it. But together we can. And if we don't, 
You know how many churches of the Nazarene used to be in South Bend area? I believe there used to be about seven churches of the Nazarene in the Michiana area. You know how many are in this town now? There's two plus a Hispanic ministries, and I think they just started a new one. But we're down half or more. Listen, if we do not reach out as a church, if we do not start being intentional about inviting people to, to discipleship groups, ABFs, adult Bible fellowships, whatever you want to call it, if we don't start being intentional about inviting friends and family members here on Sunday to hear the truth, to hear the hope, to hear the gospel, if we're not starting to be intentional about serving wherever we're needed, wherever it's needed, this church, it can die. It can close its doors. It's not easy to keep this open. It's not easy to keep running things. We, we have to all come together. We, have to, we can't do it alone. We have to do it together. That's the calling for this next year. We can. Amen? Yeah. I believe uh, that our best years are ahead. I've said that before, and I still believe that. And I think 2023 can be a great year. I remember a few years back, and I'll close closing now, but a few years back, talking about we've got this beautiful facility. We've got all kinds of classroom space. I know many years ago, this church used to be really tight. Classes were packed and all that kind of stuff because we didn't have that whole other building. But, but you and Faithfulness stepped out. Many of you gave sacrificially to, to add on to that or even to build this building to expand from the one that used to be on Colfax. God called you to do that for a reason. Not because he likes big buildings and empty rooms where we can store things. He did it to fill it with people who are lost who need to hear the gospel. So that's what our calling is. That's what God's laid on my heart for 2023. But I need you to help me to do it. Together, all of us can make something beautiful. When you connect, when you do what God's called you, created you to do. So can we do that together? Yeah. <clears throat> Next week, I'm going to look at being united in the truth. What it means to be united in God's truth. There's a type of false unity out there that people are calling for. We're not called to be falsely unified. We're called to be united together in the truth as Jesus and his Father are one in truth. And then finally, look at our mission in a few weeks. But I want to just encourage you that you begin to ask God, what is it you're asking me to do with this church? Maybe I'm already serving. Maybe I need to step up. Maybe I haven't been doing what I need to do. I need to step up to do that. But 2023 is the year. We're going to do it together. Amen. Bow your heads with me in prayer. Father, we are so uh, thankful that you have called us, that you are making us into something beautiful. You're taking all of the, the different parts and, 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 and sticking them together, uniting them together. That The force is your Holy Spirit binding us together. And God, you want us to exist. We, we do exist. You want us to reach out to those who are lost with the hope, the love, the truth of the gospel. I pray that you would just put that fire in each person's heart this morning, right now. We could not escape. We cannot leave this room and go back to being the way we were before we came. Because we've met with you. We, we've sung your praises. We've heard from your word. Just as you and the Father are one, you call us to be one together in purpose, in truth, and in mission. May it be so in our lives today, we pray. In Jesus' precious, holy name. Amen. Amen. Let's go. Let's be together. Let's be one. You're dismissed.